Once as you read Psalms chapter 31, that is the end of uh, the second, first book of Psalms, we find the started, I mean, tragic death of, of Saul and his sons, three sons. Saul, who was the king, died in a war with the Philistines and these three sons. It was so sad, it was so devastating to the Israelites to the extent that they ran and left their cities. And the Palestinians, or the Palestinians, took over some of their cities. And so when you come to the uh, first chapter of Second uh, Samuel, it tells, talks about uh, the, the confusion that came in, in this kingdom of Israel. And as go to chapter 2, and chapter 3, and chapter 4, we find David starting to take over. And David, who was anointed to become the king, finds a kingdom which is so divided and also occupied by the foreign armies or foreign uh, kingdoms. And so when you read chapter 8, David has fought. He has fought the Palestinians, he has fought the, the, the Amalekites, he has fought all the, occupier, all the occupiers who are, who are in his kingdom. And so chapter 8 tells us that David now becomes the king of Israel in Judah. He has now settled as a king of Israel and Judah. He has fought all his enemies and put them, put them under his feet. The Bible tells us that David had conquered the Assyrians, he had conquered the, the, the Amalekites, the Amorites, he had conquered all those who had occupied that kingdom when Saul was uh, defeated and killed. And they also managed to bring the community, the community of Israel together after the division. Because there are those who are still supporting Saul and were thinking that Saul's family should still be the, uh, take over as the uh, kings of Israel. And there was even a son of Saul who wanted to take over and there were people who were supporting him. And so the kingdom was divided. And so chapter 8 is the start of a new era. David becomes the king and he has conquered, he has defeated his enemies, they are under his feet. And so when you go to chapter 9, David is seated in his kingdom, he is now in, his, in the palace, he is now a king, he is now a ruler and everyone was under him and then he, ah, he was seated in his castle in chapter 9 and the first thing he asked is there anyone who has remained in the house of Saul? Is there anyone who has remained in the house of Saul? David has conquered his enemies. David is now a king. David is now in control of everything. His enemies are under his feet. And he asks, is there anyone in the house of Saul that I may do him a favor for the sake of Jonathan. And I want, I see David saying this, not that he wants to give a favor because that person is good, not that because that person is, is, is better, not that because that person is rich, but for the sake of Jonathan. And I will tell you why for the sake of Jonathan. And as he was talking to his people in the castle, they said there's a somebody who knows, who might know something and this person was called Siba. And they asked Siba, is there anyone in the house of Saul that has remained that I may be able to do him a favor for the sake of Jonathan? And the Bible tells us that Siba was somehow hesitant. He was hesitant for several reasons. One is that always when a king takes over, he makes sure he finishes all the lineage of the other king so that they will not come back and start fighting. And so in his mind, he thought that probably David would want to clear all the family of Saul. He was also hesitant, that is the writer says, he thinks that probably he was hesitant because this person, the Bible described him several times that he was lame. And not only lame, he was lame both texts. Allow me to use this word several times, not to undermine 
not to despise, but to explain my point, right? And so the Bible described this grandson of Saul as a person who was paralyzed on both legs. And at three, Ziba was not very sure because this gentleman was in a place called Lodiba. Lodiba in Hebrew means without order, disorderly, no leader, no government, rebellious, no shepherd. That is where this gentleman was. His name is so difficult for me to pronounce, more so that I have a problem of pronouncing H and H. And so uh, it's called Mephi Paul Shepherd. What that name? Allow me to call him Mephi for this purpose, so that I don't confuse you. And so this man, this grandson of Saul, was in that city. This city was a city that was not known. It was a place that was for a, a place where people were disorganized, rebels, thieves, prostitutes. Those people whom we don't want to stay with were there. But it was also a good place for hiding. And so they went with Mephi to hide him there. Because it's a place where you don't find somebody. It's a place where there is, there is no order. It's a place where you can't ask anybody anything and you get an answer. It's a place where people take drugs. It was a place where people drink. It was a place where prostitution was the order of the day. And that is where Matthew, Matthew Bosset said was. Uh, Matthew Bosset was. And the Bible says that this gentleman was not born lame. That when they heard that Saul was dead and his three sons were also dead in the war, his servant carried him and was running away with him. Then he fell down and he broke his legs. And so he went and hid him there, fearing that probably the enemies would come and kill him. And so this gentleman was both lame to legs, he was not brought up in a, a palace. You know, for you to stay in a palace, now let me explain this to you, you must be, tra you must be trained. For you to be in the king's palace, there is training that is done. I used to, I, I stayed it briefly in Uganda, and the Ugandans have kingdoms. And there was a kingdom where the father died before when the child was young. And this boy was being trained to be a, a king. He was told you should not talk to these people, you should not talk with like this. They are trained for you to be in the palace, you must be trained. Even for you to be in the state house, you must be trained. You must have etiquette. You must be able to know what to say and where to say them. And here is a gentleman who grew up in Lodiba, a place that is filthy, a square, a place that people are drunkards, a place that people are uh, drug addicts. Now you want to bring him to a palace. And that was who was warning Zipa will be able to stay in this place. Will the king accept him? And in the culture of those days, the king was to stay with strong people. To the extent that if you are a, a very uh, strong soldier, the king will give you his wife. I mean his daughter. So that you can stay here. When David killed Goliath, what did the soul do to him? He gave him the daughter. When he wanted to go and kill the Palestinians, he told him, when you kill them, when you fight them, I'll give you a daughter. That was the second daughter. So kings love people who are strong, so they can be able to help them defend their kingdoms. And they are finding somebody who is physically weak in the kingdom, in the palace, was not hard of. And so Ziba was wondering, what is David going to do to this gentleman? First, is uncultured. He's living in a place that have no order. It is disorderly. He is living in a place where bad things happen. Thieves, prostitutes, drug addicts live there. He lives in a place where you do what you, you want. But I want to remind you, friends, 
that he did not live there because he wanted. But circumstances beyond his control placed the destiny of uncertainty upon his life. And so David wanted to bring him. And David insists, bring him to me. Bring him the way he is. Bring him. Friends, this is another story of the Old Testament that tells us or shows us about grace and the love that God has for us. Amen. That even though we have lived as scholars, we have lived in this world that is unworthy, even though we are dirty, Christ is saying, bring him. Bring him. God is saying, bring him so that I can do him a favor for the sake of Christ who died for him at the cross. Amen? Amen. Christ wants us to come home. God wants to come home. Answer to come home. He's calling you. He's calling me. Not because of the anything good or what that we have done. But because of the sake of Christ who died, as, died for us at the cross. Friends. Matthew Bosseth was brought. And when he came before the king. He looked at himself. Where he has stayed. The things he has done in his life. The appearance that he was. And he looked at himself and asked the king. In verse 9. That what have you seen in a dog like me? What have you seen in such an unworthy person as me? What has God seen in an unworthy person like you? That he may send Christ to come and die for you on the cross that you may attain eternal life. What has God seen in you that he wants to save you, that he wants to put you in a palace that where he is, that you may also be? Friends, this is a show of grace. And so David calls him and tells him that not only will you eat with me on the same table, but I will refer, give back all the properties that have belonged to your father. Amen? Amen? God is ready to give us everything that was ours that we lost in the garden of Eden. And he's saying he's ready to give them unto us for the sake of Christ. He's saying he's ready to stay with us and eat with us on the same table for the sake of Christ. Amen. He wants to do it not because you are good, not because you are learned, not because you are rich, but he wants to do it for you for the sake of Christ. Amen. Friends, God is calling us that you may come out of Lodibar, the land of exile. God is calling us that you may come out of Lodibar, the land of shame and bondage. God is calling you and me that we may come out of life of a, a square to a life of plenty and peace. God is calling us that he may give us a privilege of eating with him on the same table. When you read the book of Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, the Bible said, Blessed is him who has been invited to the wedding, of, wedding supper of the, of the Lamb. Blessed is you who have been invited that you may sit with Christ and eat with him on the same table. Blessed are you who have been invited that you may be able to enjoy that serenity. You may be able to enjoy and sit with your father and savior on the same table. He says, the king says, fear not. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Our Father in heaven says, fear not, regardless of who you are, regardless of what you have done, fear not, for I want to save you, I want to bless you, I want to show you kindness for the sake of what Christ did for you at the cross. Amen? Amen. And he's calling us that we may live, Lord Ibra, a place that is full of sinfulness and suffering. A place that is full of 
poverty and anything that is bad, God is calling us that we may take us home. He's calling us that we may live where we are because Christ has saved us. God is asking you and is asking each one of us, are you ready to be saved for the sake of Christ who died for you at the cross? Are you ready to live Lodiba, which is the things that we do in this world and the world that we live in, and embrace Christ as your Savior? Christ is calling you and me that he has done everything for you. Just come out of Lodiba. Just come and stay with me. Just come and eat with me. In verse 13 of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9, where we have read, the Bible says, that so more Mephis uh, or seventh dwelt in Jerusalem for he ate continually at the king's table and he was laid on both feet. The Bible is trying to describe that even though he was that who he was, he was managed to continually eat at the king's table. Even though you are unworthy, my friend, even though you are unworthy, my brother, my sister, when you come for the sake of Christ, you will continually eat at the table of God. Amen? Amen. We are called today that we may come out of Lodiba, that we may go to the palace that God has built and prepared for us. And we are called not because we are good. We are called not because of anything, but we are called because of, for the sake of Christ was God made us righteous that we may receive the blessings from God. I want to conclude. I told you, I remember what the young man told me that elder, we like quantity, quality, not the quantity. I don't want to go so much because others have started sleeping and I know the time has gone and we are hungry. But I want to remind you, my brothers and sisters, that God sent Christ to come and die for us. That we may attain eternal life. That we may be received, not because of who we are, but for the sake of Christ. We may be counted righteous. And so the Bible says, David told the people, his counsel, bring him here. Bring him whatever he is or whoever he is. Wherever he is, bring him here, regardless of who he is, for the sake of his grandfather or for the sake of his father, Jonathan, I want to do him a favor. Christ has died for us, and for his sake, God wants to do us a favor. He says in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, chapter, chapter 19, verse 9. Uh, write this, blessed are they, uh, are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And these are true sayings of God. My brothers and my sisters, Christ has fought and finished the battle. All his enemies are under his feet. And he's now settled. He has now settled and asking, where are you? Come out of Lodiba that I may give you the blessings, that I may give you the things that you lost, that I may give you, I make you a prince again, that you may be a prince again. Christ is calling us today. And as I finish, I want to just ask and make a simple call that he who feels that he's been in Lodiba, and he who thinks that he has passed by Lodiba, that he wants to come out of Lodiba, that he wants to stay far from Lodiba, that he wants to come to Christ, he wants to live with Christ, he wants to be praised again, he wants to receive all that God had prepared for him. Just like this gentleman met, I want to let you know that when God created us, he said, oh, we, everything was good. He made us good. But when sin entered in us, 
it paralyzed us. It paralyzed us spiritually to the extent that Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 24, that, oh, wretched man, oh, wretched man, who will save me from this body of death? That what we want to do, we can't do. We do what we don't want to do. But Paul says, turn to Christ. Turn to our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we are able to overcome. Turn to him who died for us on the cross, that we may have a new, we may be a new creation. Thanks to him, he has called us that we may receive back what we lost at the beginning of Eden. That we may be a new creatures. That we may be princes and princesses again. That we may receive all that we lost on that day in the garden of Eden. God bless your two sons. If you think that you want to come out of Lodibra, if you think that you want to come out of the things that throws you away from God, that he may bless you. May you just stand so that you may be able to pray. As you prepare to stand, I want to tell you a small story of a man who had killed, who had stolen, he was a robber, he was a killer. And he was jailed for life. And one time when people were having a crusade in the prison. They preached and they had one theme song that they were singing every day. And that song is number 524. And one day this man God said, 123, one day this man God said, and people went to him and told him, do you think you are going to be released now that you have been saved? Do you think by getting baptized you will now be okay. People who, whom you killed, who, people whom you hurt, people whom you uh, destroyed their lives will now forgive you. Do you think that by accepting Christ now, probably the government might think of giving you uh, a leisure punishment? And the gentleman stood up and answered this way, my brothers and sisters. I need no any other evidence. I need no any other plea. I know it is enough for me that Jesus died and rose again for me. It is enough for me that Jesus saves that this is ends my fear and doubt. That even though I'm in this prison, I know it is enough that Jesus died for me. That this ends my fear and doubt. Whether I'm forgiven or I'm not forgiven, I know God has forgiven me. I know Christ has died for me. I know my soul is resting on the word, the living word of God. I trust no any other thing. I trust only the living one. That it will plead for me. I need no any other evidence. And if you believe you need no any other evidence, that Christ has died for you, that it's enough for you that Jesus died and rose again for you, can you rise that you may be able to pray? Our Heavenly Father, our God and our Creator, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you so much for your love and mercies that are new every morning. It is enough for us that Jesus died. We need no any other evidence. We need no any other plea, Lord, because you, are, you have saved us. It is enough and it has removed our fear and doubt in our hearts. And as you call us this afternoon, Lord, that we may come out of the things that are known not worthy of your calling. Dear Lord, may you accept us and bless us. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much for reminding us that we are not of this world. That there is a place for us. That we are not just people. That we are princes and princes. That God has prepared a place for us. That we are people who need to stay in a palace. Not in a squalors. Or in squalors. Father, I thank you. I praise you for accepting our prayers. I thank you for talking to us. We hold us to our righteous right hand. That may we walk with you. Just as I not walk with you. 
the very end, Jesus never tries to pray. Amen. Please don't miss to come in the afternoon so that we may be able to talk more about uh, 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 possibility ministry. Let us all rise up with the closing song, 5, 2, 3. What is that, please? in our behalf. Father, he took all the condemnation. He took all our sins away. Now that we are free children before you, Holy God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good message that has come at hand to your children. And we pray that your Holy Spirit may help us to construe and understand the message and pick 
move closer to thee. For we are far away from you, but Father, because of Jesus, we have been moved closer to thee, and we are breaking. May you give us strength so that we can continue walking on your ways. As we pray again for lunch, help us so that we come back for this message so that we can be nourished in our hearts. For this is our humble prayer in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. And happy day. Happy Sabbath. Um, before we before we break for for lunch, I have a statement to make, and I want that the church to listen to be carefully. Those who are talking or who are thinking of going. Uh, for lunch, kindly, just a minute. Um, the Bible tells us that uh, towards the end times, there will be false prophets and the false teachers who will deceive God's children and even the apostle, even the right. Uh, of the recent past, I think uh, the, uh, the course of uh, this uh, past week, we have uh, heard things in social media and TV screens, which was published by MTV, right? Yes. And uh, yeah, there were so many things said even in our church walls uh, and uh, elsewhere. And uh, if you check our church wall, I've posted uh, a clip there and a statement by the church. And uh, the claims were on three areas. That is fasting, schools, and time. Okay? Uh, some claims which are not true. And uh, I felt like it's necessary to make this statement that as a, a seven day Adventist believer, know what you believe in. Uh, that with the studying, I want to say that uh, within our church, we have people whom we call offshoots and uh, extremists okay people who go overboard to what the church believes so the statement is very clear that uh, we believe that when you are sick you know where i was sick last week i went to the hospital i was given medication you find somebody who's telling you like uh, when you are sick we can give you some uh, uh, apple tree somewhere someplace the church believes that uh, when somebody is sick, you finish the hospital, okay? And some of those teachings you have never heard in your past that tell you so. And we believe that uh, your children are supposed to go to where? To schools. That is why we have a Adventist education, alright? And we believe that the Bible teaches about fasting, okay? But it is fasting that is not that of Shadhaw. You know, some people can mean to be malicious. Marrying and injuring the church of God. Okay? When we have a fasting Sabbath here, it is for interim. And the fasting is not all about food alone. You can fast from your faults. Right? So kindly, be vigilant. When you find some things which are being uh, thought out there, say that that one has not come from my pastor. Because we teach what the Bible has to say. And because we are Christians, we may not go and sue somebody in court. But you who are the beneficiary of the messages we preach from here, you know what your pastor teach you to do, okay? And you know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church it is the true church of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. So kindly stand, defend your church, and defend your faith. The church has made a statement. And those who give these statements, let's pray for them and help them to remain in the cause of God. God bless you. Yes, thanks a lot everyone.
And uh, Sister Valentine kindly pray for lunch, even as we do the items to usher us out. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the gift of life. Thank you for today. Thank you for the message that we've had. Even as we're going to partake of the food, uh, may you bless it as we take it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we do need us a kiss of 139. <laughs>